All right. Wow. I've literally never seen a crowd sit down in the 10 years I've been doing this. So uh, you're all very excited for the presentation. Uh, my name is Jeff Belisario. I'm the executive director of the Bayer Council Economic Institute. We are the council's think tank. I like to say that we make charts and graphs. So we have, we have like 70 of them. So uh, take notes, uh, lots of charts and graphs coming. Uh, let me start just by thanking, first of all, all of you. Um, early morning, rain, moving boat. You might not know, but the heat doesn't actually work down here. Uh, so I, I've told we're going to print out some like I survived the Outlook breakfast t-shirts. So look for those in the mail. Uh, thank you to, uh, to CBRE and the whole CBR team. Uh, huge thank you for the, the help uh, in the project we're going to launch in the middle of this session. Uh, huge thank you for sponsoring and all the partnership there. Um, I'm going to give you just a bit of a roadmap, and then we've got a couple welcomes. So we're going to start macro, global. We're going to hear from the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank, kind of a national global outlook. Uh, you're going to hear from my team on an index we just released today. And then we're going to close talking mainly about San Francisco and commercial real estate. But before I do that, we've got a couple welcomes. So let me welcome up Jim Wonderman. Uh, he's the captain of the boat here, president and CEO of the Bayer Council, uh, to give you some context for this morning. Jim. Thanks, Jeff. You don't want me to be... You don't want me to be captain of anything. Um, welcome. It's great to have you. How many, how many of you first time on the Klamath? Good number of you. So uh, welcome aboard. Uh, thanks for uh, braving it on a, uh, on a stormy day. And hopefully, you know, sometimes the boat rocks a lot. And then the other times it, it rocks really a lot. Um, and in this weather, it's probably more likely to do the latter. So if you feel something that kind of feels like shuddering, it's very unlikely to be an earthquake. It could be an earthquake, but it's probably not. It's probably just the boat kind of bumping up against the moorings and it makes kind of a funny feeling and sometimes make, you know, could make you a little nervous, but it, it's okay. We're, those of us who work here, we're, we're pretty used to it and uh, it should be okay. In the case of an emergency, a, a real emergency, you know, I would recommend going out those back doors and cross, uh, you know, cross that ramp over there to get to the pier. Hopefully today we'll, we won't provide any of that. So I'm, I'm Jim Wonderman. I'm the president and, and CEO of the Bay Area Council. I've been in the job a long time, almost 19 years. Uh, I work. I was deputy mayor of the city a couple of times here in San Francisco. <clears throat> so I've seen a lot of uh, changes in the economy over that period of time, and a lot of predictions about where we're going to be and can we recover and what you know what will happen. And you know we've we've been fortunate up to this point where we've always been, not only been able to recover, but we've always ended up outperforming, sometimes to our own detriment, where you know, we really didn't have the infrastructure and the capacity to handle everybody who wants to be here, which ended up with you know, mile high uh, rents and uh, not, you know, crazy traffic and a lot of kind of material impacts on the quality of life that then give people sort of pause on the Bay Area. Then, then you know, this time, is different, of course. We're we're recovering, still recovering from the pandemic, which was uh, you know, put a you know massive uh, pre downward pressure on the Bay Area's economy because nobody was doing anything and staying home and working remote. And as we began to emerge from it, uh, you know, we we saw that remote work was a lasting trend. It wasn't a fad uh, or a way to get by just uh, during a pandemic. So so we're all kind of dealing with the economic effect with that, which is why. Jeff says, you know, why are you all so quiet? And well, you're all nervous, you know, because you don't know what you're going to hear here, but, but you're interested, I think, uh, because it's really incumbent upon us to understand uh, the future. So this is an important report that uh, CBRE, uh, I want to really thank, thank uh, you, Joe, and, and your team for coming up with this concept and working with us on an idea to do a multi-year study <clears throat> on the Bay Area's uh, emancipation, if you will, from the, uh, from the uh, darkest days of the pandemic. So, you know, today is kind of the first report on how we've been doing and how we're doing and how we, you know, might, might see the future. But clearly, you know, in addition to the pandemic, you know, we now have some other uh, headwinds, which may or may not be related. We've got very high inflation, very high interest rates. Uh, we're seeing uh, tech companies that oversubscribe to hiring people that are undersubscribing and we're seeing, you know, for the first time uh, layoffs, you know, maybe, th maybe there's a recession, I guess we'll come in or maybe there's not, we'll talk about that. Um, but generally speaking, uh, it, we'd rather see better data than what you're about to see. 
So I, I think it's a, it's a little bit somber. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's huge surprises here because it's fairly consistent with the trends that we've been seeing. But you know, it's the Bay Area. There's always good reason to be optimistic if we work on addressing the things that are kind of dragging us down. And we've got issues that are dragging us down and making it less desirable for people to come back to work and come back to San Francisco, for example, since we're here and San Francisco is, you know, is, is really in the you know, center of the storm in a lot of ways uh, with homelessness and with safety and with our transportation system, people not wanting to ride, ride BART. A lot, of, a lot of those factors are making remote work more attractive than uh, we, would, we would like to see. So uh, we're, you know, we need to go forward with real solutions, get, get out of the comfort zone. Uh, we did a report on taxation in San Francisco uh, in the Bay Area, which showed San Francisco particularly really way out of whack uh, with the uh, with the rest of the Bay Area. I guess the Chronicle wrote an article today that said it's not so. Taxes don't matter. So I want to. The first lesson of the day is that very very high taxes have no effect on business decisions. So this is something you can learn. All you got to do is read the Chronicle, and you'll see that that's uh, how it works. Um, so. Uh, what we've done here is track progress across uh, across metros, so we could kind of see how our region fares in comparison to others. So a lot of work went into this. I want to give tremendous credit to to uh, to Jeff and to Abby, uh, who, who and the team from the Economic Institute who put heart and soul into this, and the team from CBRE. You know, it was a great example of a partnership. So let me uh, introduce to you uh, the leader of CBRE who really made this possible, which, who is uh, Joe Wallace. He's the president of advisory services. He leads their uh, CBRE's advisory services across the business lines in the Bay Area, uh, encompassing over 600 professionals across six regional offices, uh, commercial real estate, brokerage, debt, structured finance, capital markets, property management, and valuations. And Joe has over 35 years of practical uh, real estate experience, but still learning, right, Joe? So come on up, Joe. Thank you very much for uh, making this happen. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Jim, very much. And on behalf of everybody at CBRE, I just wanted to thank the uh, Bay Area Council and the Economic Institute uh, for doing this phenomenal uh, work that they're going to share with you uh, a little bit later on. Um, the genesis of this um, really started in mid-2021, and we, at that point, we were looking at what was happening to the, uh, the region. And while we really didn't know, I think everybody's crystal ball was a little, were, were, were a little cloudy at that point, but we didn't really know what was going to happen, but we knew what was happening was going to be really important. And we felt like it was critical that we catalog it that we try to understand what's happening to our region economically, uh, that we uh, interpret it uh, and eventually use it as a jumping off point for uh, investment decisions and policy and whatever else is needed. So as we looked around at the organizations that were really set up to do this and to do this well, uh, the first uh, place we thought of was the Bay Area Council. Uh, there's really not another organization that we felt would be able to do, uh, to do the, the type of work that we envisioned. So, um, so that was the, uh, the genesis of it. We, although we didn't know how it's going to turn out and probably still don't know how things are going to turn out. We knew that if you take this, uh, global leveling once in a lifetime event, like the pandemic and you fire it into the heart of the global technology, uh, capital that, uh, that the collision will produce some interesting outputs that need to be studied. And that was really, uh, the genesis for the, uh, for the work that you'll hear about. Um, the second reason that we wanted to do it was just that um, it was going to personally save me a lot of time because um, we have 115,000 employees globally, but I get calls and questions and emails um, all the time about, hey, how is the Bay Area doing? And it's because the Bay Area, uh, we punch above our weight. And this is a far more, uh, everybody in the world is interested in what's happening to the Bay Area. And that's why this is more important than just uh, to all of us who uh, are in business here. Uh, everybody in this room knows we export our technologies and our talent and our commerce and our and, and more importantly our ideas around the around the globe. So people want to know what's happening here. And if you don't believe me, just look at the New York Times or the Economist because there's an article about the Bay Area Bay Area in almost every uh, in every uh, uh, you know newspaper uh, article that they come up with. It's sometimes it's the leaders of the Silicon Valley or the 
politicians of the Silicon Valley. Um, on Sunday, the New York Times, it was the furniture resellers of the Silicon Valley. So, so uh, with that, um, thank you again to Jim and to Jeff and to Abby for some outstanding work. And I'm going to turn it back over to Jeff. All right. I promised you charts and graphs. So we're going to start, uh, before we get to the bear, we're going to start macro. Um, so I want to welcome up Sylvan Leduc. Um, he is the Executive Vice President and Director of Economic Research at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. Uh, he oversees research and analyses to inform a uh, very important monetary policy decision-making process. I don't think you're going to give us an outlook on interest rates necessarily, but we're going to get some good indicators on, on what the Fed is thinking. Um, I've told all of our speakers to be exceptionally positive, so we'll, uh, we'll see if that actually works. Uh, so let me welcome out Sylvan. Floor is Yeah, I debated uh, putting too many charts here at nine, nine o'clock in the morning uh, with too much data. Might make you a little bit dizzy. There are bags over there, <laughs> if that's the case. So I thought I would talk, of course, about the, the macro outlook. And so what I want to argue is that uh, the economy is still out of balance. Uh, and that's reflected in the fact that inflation is still way too high and that economic growth is, is still too strong. And so as a, as a result, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna put a chart, I promise I'll put a chart. So it's not gonna be a forecast, but it's gonna be a, a chart. As a result, uh, we're likely to see higher interest rates in the coming uh, quarters or so. And they're probably gonna stay higher for longer. And I think we'll need this to, to achieve uh, the Federal Reserve goal. So let me put this up uh, to start with, what, what, are the, what are the goals of, uh, what, am I missing it? What are the goals of the of the Fed here? The, the Fed has two goals: maximum employment and uh, and uh, and price stability. Maximum employment is kind of this weird concept. We don't observe directly what's maximum employment, so we look at a whole array of uh, of data uh, to to assess it. Uh, but basically, you can kind of understand it as everyone who wants a job can can get one in in a market with uh, with full employment. Price stability, we, uh, again, like we, we define it as low inflation, low enough that it doesn't really distort your economic decision making, either whether you're a household or, or a firm. And so in practice, we aim for 2% inflation uh, over time. Okay, so low inflation. So clearly we're not, we're not there yet. So this is a chart of, uh, of inflation rate, uh, PC inflation, which is the index we, we target. There's a lot of wiggles here. Just notice a few things. You know, it, it was kind of, it went up in the 60s and 70s to very high level above 10%. Since then it went down mostly. And we had a, about 40 years of very low inflation, about 2% on average. Oh, okay, sure. About 2% on average. And so since, uh, and, and of course, post pandemic, Inflation just shot up to more than 6%. Maybe like uh, more encouraging news is that since about uh, June last year, it seems that inflation has peaked. So, so this is encouraging. Um, I don't have, this is not, I'm sorry. Like I don't have the, this is not the right slide deck. So let, let me, let me, let me think about uh, a couple of things that are interesting to, to see with this is that some of it is just coming from, uh, you know, the encouraging news is that the economy continues to normalize. And you see this here a little bit. So this shows uh, uh, real expenditure on goods. <clears throat> and we know, like, I like this chart because it really shows how, how it impacted the, the pandemic, how the pandemic impacted real spending. Uh, and so, you know, the authorities shut down the economy, we stopped uh, buying services, and we basically started buying, buying goods. And so goods, uh, expenditure on goods really, really shot up. And you, you see this uh, very clearly on, on the charts. But since then, uh, the demand is shifting back towards services now. Uh, and this is, uh, this is really encouraging. Uh, so, so things are, are normalizing. Uh, the flip side of that is that we're seeing services, we're seeing services uh, go, going up. So services not, like we're seeing the shift uh, of expenditure moving from goods towards services, okay? So, so services uh, is moving and those are being reflected in inflation rates. So if you look at goods, goods inflation, uh, 
So this is durable good, but if you look at goods inflation, the same thing, goods inflation is coming down now, and it's coming down relatively fast. And this is a, a combination of two things, this rotation of consumption away from goods towards services, but also the fact that the supply chain disruption that we've seen uh, are, really, uh, are really improving. Uh, so, so this is encouraging. One thing that we're wondering about is where are we gonna end up? Okay, we, so if you look at, here, for instance, here, durable goods, we've had deflation in durable goods for the longest time. And so this is a combination of factors, technological progress, and globalization. And so for the past 25 years or so, goods prices, durable goods prices, but also goods prices tended to fall year after year. For durable goods prices, you had deflation of about one, one and a half percent. And so the question now is, are we gonna go back to this previous world where we had the same kind of impact on, on goods inflation? Or, or are we gonna be in a different world where maybe uh, you know, because of pressures on, on global supply chains, maybe a, a need to reshore, are we gonna see a, bit, a little bit more inflation in this sector at least towards you know, during that transition period? And it's not clear at this moment. I mean, the contacts uh, we talked to indicates that they would like maybe to, to near shore, French shore, bring, bring uh, production a little bit closer back to, to the United States. But I think that's gonna take some time to do this. It's really difficult to, to revamp the whole network um, production process that's often located in, uh, in, in Southeast Asia. And so that's, that's gonna take some time to do this. So our, our take is that we're likely to see goods prices, uh, good price inflation coming down towards zero or, or slight deflation. And that's important because that's the, 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 the next thing is, is really services and services inflation is still, is still rising. As we're shifting from goods towards services, we see this big pickup in services inflation. And that's kind of where it's a little bit more worrisome for Fed uh, policymakers. And so you've, you've heard a lot of, some of it here is, 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 is housing, housing services. Part of it is rent. Uh, so what, what you think about in services, you're, you're thinking about uh, more healthcare services is part of that. You have restaurants, uh, going, going to the movies, that, that, those kinds of expenditures. Uh, it's also rent, actually, housing inflation, rent inflation. That's part of that. Uh, and as we're tightening policy, and policy has tightened by more than 450 basis points, as, as you know, over the past year or so, as, you, as you're seeing this, uh, rent inflation is moderating. So we're seeing big drops in house price inflation, in rent infl in new rent, like the, the one that are, that are being asked. Uh, and so those are coming down relatively quickly. And, and so over time, we know that rent inflation is gonna diminish and it's gonna weigh on services inflation. But even when you abstract from those, from, from rent inflation, you're seeing big, uh, you're, seeing, you're still seeing inflation in the services sector that's relatively high. And, and we know that that's, that, the problem with this is that it, it tends to be stickier. So compared to goods price inflation, that's more volatile. Services inflation tends to be stickier. A big part of the cost uh, in that sector is of course labor costs. And, and, and so it tends to be a little bit more sticky. So, so the Fed is, is really raising rates to try to bring a little bit more balance in this market. The labor, so we're seeing the impact of this in, in the housing sector, like as I just mentioned. So we, we're seeing this in, in interest sensitive sector in manufacturing, for instance, a lot that, that, that the, the sector is slowing clearly. Where we're seeing it less is in labor markets. And this is where it's important because the labor market is tied to, to service price inflation. Uh, what we're seeing is that an employment rate that's a, a, that, at say a 50 year low, uh, we're seeing vacancies, the number of job openings per unemployed worker, that's still very high, about two job openings per unemployed worker. And, and we're not seeing a whole lot of progress right now along that dimension. And, and employment growth has been very strong. So if you look at gains per month, typically a good economy would have 200,000 new jobs being created a month. Uh, we're seeing much more than that. Uh, on average, you're, you're, still, you're still higher than this. So the, the, the clip of job creation is very high. Last month, we've seen more than 500,000 new jobs being created. So we've looked into this a little bit. It looked normal because we had seen job gains moderating over uh, the past year or so. Uh, so we've looked into this a, a bit. Uh, some of it seems to be due to unseasonal weather pattern, extreme weather events. So we have a team, a new team at the San Francisco Fed looking into climate change and the impact on the economy. It seems that some of it is reflected in the job numbers in January. 
it accounts maybe for 100,000 of those jobs. So we're still, you know, we'd still be 400,000 new job being created, even if we take into account that, that effect. And so, and so it's still very, very strong. So no doubt that the job market uh, is, is, uh, is, is being very robust. The other thing that we're looking at uh, right now, apart from the, the job market, is really consumption growth. So consumption growth continues to be strong in part because the, how the, the labor market is still very, very healthy. One thing we're looking at is how much of the, like, people have a lot of savings. They've accumulated a lot of savings during the pandemic, giving government transfers that were, that were uh, provided. Uh, about about two, two trillion about uh, that in excess saving that have been accumulated since then, those have been decumulated to, to, to consume a little bit more. And so, but we're still about seven, $800 billion in excess savings. So then the question is what's gonna happen with that? Are we gonna see extra spending this year? as people have this extra cushion. Uh, and so are we gonna see this bumping consumption growth and leading to potentially extra price pressures or are people just hoarding the cash you know, as, as rainy day funds? So we're not exactly sure. We're not exactly sure either who has the money. Like we know more about the aggregate, but our lower income household having this, this, this extra cash uh, that they're more likely to spend or is this uh, really held by higher income households who are likely, uh, more likely to, to save it. So in terms of uh, interest outlooks, uh, over the past uh, two months, I would say there's some, there was some disagreement between policymakers at the Fed and, uh, and financial markets. Uh, so uh, policymakers would, would see rates going up a little bit higher as of December, the last time they, they, they do forecast four times a year. As of December, they saw rates rising uh, about five, five point one, a little bit above five percent. Uh, market participant, and then holding it for for most of 2023 before maybe declining a little bit in 2024. Uh, financial markets viewed this uh, as uh, as unlikely. Like they, they were much more optimistic, and part of it was that they viewed inflation as coming down faster, and so that the Fed could be could be able to to lower rates uh, earlier in 2023. Uh, this has changed dramatically with the employment report that we saw for, for January and, for the, and with the, the latest inflation data that we got for last month. So now financial market participants are seeing higher uh, interest rates for this year, uh, you know, going about five, uh, about five and a half percent and staying above five percent for basically the next year and a half. Uh, so for policymakers at the Fed, we'll have a new, a new round of forecasts in March, uh, we'll see what that's uh, what that's going to lead to. It's likely to be to be a little bit higher than we had uh, in December, given the strength uh, of the data. So, uh, so let me stop here. I'm I'm happy to take questions about about anything about the the macro economy and how we're seeing the economy evolve. Thank you. You can wait for the microphone to come around. Sorry. Good morning. I'm Scott Littlehale with the NorCal Carpenters Union. Um, you mentioned the labor market, uh, keen interest to us, of course. Wanted to get any observations you might have on, you know, the trends with the employment to population ratio, particularly for prime age working men, um, which by my quick check is lower than it was pre-pandemic and, and prior cycles, as well as uh, quit, quit rates and what the quit rates are in terms of your overview of things. Retires earlier than if they would have had a uh, 
until we're not uh, we don't be mystic about it. Mystic out is intelligent. But giving that he's not bestowed, he should be still away, but we're not expecting a whole lot. Good grace is a, is a good example here with where Placements more around. More questions. All right, we'll go to the middle here. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, had a had a couple questions. You mentioned that there's eight hundred billion dollars that sort of that, uh, you know, in, in excess in terms of savings. Um, one question is, did we overdo it? You know, there, well, under Obama, we had done, what, a $900 billion program and people thought, well, we never did it enough. And then of course, we're not gonna make that mistake again. I'm just wondering if you think we overdid it um, in terms of stimulus between Trump, the end of Trump and, and, and the Biden. And then I'm also curious, you mentioned, we don't really know this 800, Billion, who has it? Even though we we did give money to people, right? Do we just not have the data to figure out who owns this money? I mean, it seems like that's very, very critical data to have. And I'm just curious why we don't have it. Terms of the first question, I think at the time, yeah, we were the guy. I think we didn't do it. This is not the response we think authorities or government were worried that we can it took a lot, it took a long time for the economy to come up. So there was probably that in people's mind. In terms of analysis, we've done analysis of the people fed about the impact of the government transfer to foreign We see that it, uh, we, we uh, uh, found that it accounted for some of the discrepancies between the high inflation rate and the compared to other rates uh, compared to inflation in Europe and so it was You mentioned job creation and, and labor force participation as two of the sort of key pillars of what's happening today. I'm wondering how how's the Fed classifying independent contractors, gig economy workers who may have left a corporate job, right, sold their home in uh, San Francisco and moved somewhere else and started an Airbnb type of company or something like that. Is, is that having an impact on sort of the unemployment rate? I, I'm just curious, like, how do you classify those workers within, you know, those two pillars? So we're not classifying that. This would be coming from the labor statistics. I think in, in terms of overall, this, this is still relatively small, this, this, this part of, uh, of, of its activity. So we're not seeing this as being the main driving force behind what we're seeing. And maybe constraints on, on labor supply. It's still very difficult to find work to the balance the uh, sector, uh, maybe for obvious reasons. And maybe for the fact that people have switched from people didn't want to work in that sector anymore, have switched to maybe IT jobs or, or paper jobs. And now it's just difficult to, to switch back and get that go back. And maybe like wages are higher in that sector. <clears throat> Go to the middle there, Mark Ron, outside. 
Hello, Norbert Holtkamp. Thank you from Stanford. Um, a question on recent uh, legislation. The, the, these big programs uh, put up by the government, federal government on the CHIPS Act, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, all those things. Do you think, is there a way for you to track or be able to track how that impacts these inflation curves? Uh, so, you know, given the given the change in people who go to offices or work remotely, then you know we've got these huge vacancy rates here, and I, I don't know about other metro areas, but I suspect the same is the case in other metro areas. And now you start seeing people walking away from their mortgages on the buildings and saying, uh, you can have it, bank or investors. What about the cumulative effect of that? And as leases run out and more people walk away, does this affect the banking system like the mortgage meltdown? Yeah, so we're, we're, we're paying attention to that. I can, I can guarantee the, the out the uh, financial stability report uh, every year we have uh, we have reports uh, for the policymakers and four times a year as well this is the topic of the great recession and we're asking the banking okay, so it's an SEC I think the banks are in much better position than they were in 12 years ago compared to the last and so I said that risk is not as uh, they're not vulnerable Housing in general that they were 10 years ago. I think they'll play out differently in different markets. I think it is different. Some cities, people are back. People are there like four days, uh, four days a week. And markets like San Francisco and fashion to a different level. But then it's more okay, what are we going to do with these buildings? Is that are they going to be refurbished? Is that going to be done? Some buildings are being much more refurbished. So I think that will depend a little bit what kind of market you are, what kind of buildings you want to perform or they'll lose the entire market. So, so you mentioned that there's uh, some work going on on climate change at the bank. Um, I'm wondering if uh, you already incorporated any climate change impacts already in the forecasts uh, of GDP, labor market, inflation. Yeah, 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, moving to credit for, for a second, how much does it concern you if I look at the senior loan officer surveys that show uh, flat to negative uh, credit growth uh, among businesses, tightening lending conditions that came out in January, and then the substantial increase in consumer credit um, that I think by my accounts is up by about $800 billion uh, from 2019 to the fourth quarter of 22. Is that a canary in the coal mine that we should be looking at as far as beginning to see what you guys are trying to do with the slowing of the economy? So over time, that's what we would expect. This point, I think the economy remains very strong. Other questions for Sylvan? Yeah, Jim. Yeah, thank, thank you. So last week in this room, we had the head of the uh, China uh, Friendship Association. I think it's the China People's uh, Friendship Association with people from foreign countries. And if you were part of that dialogue, you'd have thought that the relations between the two countries are really good. And we have a good relationship. And, you know, there are pretty strong ties between the Bay Area and China and the Chinese community. When you get out of here, and you, especially when you get to Washington, it seems like the relations aren't too good. And um, you know, we're talking more and more about, uh, you know, in, more imminent threats and deep concerns. Does the Fed consider the relation, you know, that we're so intertwined with the Chinese economy in so many ways. Does the Fed consider the relationship with China in the risk category? And how do you assess that? Other questions? Uh, one indicator that's important to this city and the Bay Area is the amount of venture funding, which is um, available and being pumped into uh, startups as much as anything. And, and the effect that has on the viability of pension funds, you know, larger sources of capital. Are, I'm assuming you're tracking that in some instance and trying to forecast the venture infusion to local and regional economies. I would say we are not detailed enough to incorporate that into 
I just had a clarifying question. Um, the job creation that you're mentioning, is that Bay Area local or is that federal, at the federal nationwide level? Okay. Do you have a view on the Bay Area specific job creation rates or is it not that detailed? National. Okay, thank you. All right, I have a, a final, most likely off the record conversation. I currently rent. I'm looking to buy a home. Good idea or bad idea? Is, is that an answer? Okay, I'll, I'll read into that a little bit. I'll tell my wife. Okay. <laughs> All right, please join me in thanking Sylvan for the great outlook to the fun. Thanks so much. All right, everybody's okay? The t-shirts are printing out here, you survived the outlook. All right, so we're moving next now uh, to our regional economic recovery index. So this is much more Bay Area focused, many more charts and graphs coming. Uh, let me welcome up Abby Royce, who is our research manager. She put a lot of work into this. Um, she's our, our chief data nerd. Uh, she loves the charts, graphs, and maps, so you'll see a lot of those coming up here. Welcome up, Abby. Thank you. Is this on? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm probably just going to tell you guys to do next slide because it's just easier for me. <laughs> but you guys all must be just as nerdy as us if you're willing to come here and brave this weather to hear us talk about economic recovery. So um, thank you, Jeff, and, and thanks, Sylvan, as well, for those insights. And good morning, everyone. Like Jeff said, my name is Abby Royce. I'm a research manager at the Bay Area Council Economic Institute. Um, and uh, I led much of the data work. I'll wait till we get to my... I led much of the data work and analysis for this project, so I'm very excited to be here um, and share with you some of our key findings. Uh, like Jeff said, we like to joke here at the Institute that, you know, we're a lot of things to the Bay Area Council. We're the research arm, we're the economic policy think tank, but at our core, we make a lot of charts and graphs, so that's Basically, what I'll be showing you today is a lot of charts and graphs. Um, I probably should have called this presentation, you know, surviving the storm or something, but um, that would have been a very, very topical, but I did not. Um, so next slide. So a quick summary. Um, the main aim of this research uh, was to evaluate and track some key indicators of economic recovery in the region um, by way of two things. So the first being a comprehensive sort of one of a kind economic recovery index, which I'll get into into a moment, and then a deep dive um, on the Bay Area and, and sort of what's driving the region's recovery. Um, and we wanted this to be extremely user-friendly, interactive, something we could update regularly. So this report is actually fully dynamic, lives up on our site. I linked it. I'll, we'll send out a link after this event as well. Um, next slide. So starting with the index, uh, one of the most novel things to sort of come out of this research, research is our index with which tracks and scores um, 25 different metropolitan statistical areas um, with the largest regional GDPs on a number of, of key metrics. So I wanna make very clear that this is pretty backward looking. So this isn't forward looking. The purpose of this index is to really benchmark where we are, um, you know, how have we fared compared to peer regions. So most of these metrics track uh, some sort of rate of change. So looking at like a, a pre-pandemic benchmark 2019 to the most current data available. So usually 2021, 2022, final quarter of, of last year. Um, and for anyone looking to get into the weeds on the math, we have a very detailed methodology section. I assume some of you probably would be interested in that. But to keep, in sim uh, keep it pretty simple, we scored each region on 15 different metrics, which I'll show in the following slide, across five different categories you can see here. Jobs, people, investment, economic activity, and affordability. So 100 indicates that that region ranked first on every metric in that category. A score of zero would indicate that that region ranked last on every category. Next slide. So I, I know this is a lot. I don't expect you to read all of these things, but we really just wanted to give a sense of all the metrics that we included here. You see those five categories I mentioned. We have your old faithfuls, we have your classics, we have job growth, population growth, VC funding, things like that. But we also included here some pretty novel analyses. So one of those being you know, sales tax revenues, which we had to you know manually collect those data across city level financial reports and put them together and look at, at how those have, have differed across different metro areas. Um, next slide. And so here's how our final rankings look. Uh, and before I get into it, I just want to point out 
this is a, a regional index. So we're using metro areas here. The SF metro includes Oakland and includes Berkeley and it includes San Mateo County. Um, San, San Jose metro includes most of Silicon Valley. Um, so Austin, unsurprisingly, unless you've been, you know, maybe living under a rock is, is or if you've been following its meteoric growth over the last couple of years, it, it ranked first on our index. Um, so 86 represents a weighted average across those 15 different metrics that I just showed. Um, and within those 15 metrics, it ranked number one, so 100 out of 100 on six different metrics on job growth, so fastest, greatest job growth, knowledge worker growth is what, what we're calling it, I'll explain that in a moment, um, population growth, labor force growth, uh, net absorption, so a key sort of supply and demand indicator for uh, office commercial real estate. Um, and uh, new housing units per capita. Austin built a lot of housing during the pandemic. Um, it also scored very high on that sales tax revenue piece that I mentioned. Um, so it actually experienced 13% uh, more sales, brought in 13% more sales taxes um, or more dollars in sales tax revenue from 2019 to 2021. Um, so these figures really speak to sort of the dramatic growth and resilience of Austin, Texas as a whole, you know, Dallas is number two um, uh, during the pandemic. Meanwhile, places like San Francisco, New York have really continued to suffer uh, losses. So the following slides will kind of show why, uh, show some of the data that fed the index, why San Francisco ranks second to last, which might be pretty unsurprising to most of you. Um, next slide, please. All right, so starting with jobs, um, and you know, we ranked all 25 metros that I, that I showed for every category, but for the purposes of this presentation, I'm just gonna show you know, bottom five, top five, and then San Francisco and San Jose to make it more legible. Um, so as far as, as, as jobs, by the end of 2022, we were still down about 1% of pre-pandemic employment, you can see here. Um, which ranked us not at the bottom, but close to the bottom. So we ranked 20th out of 25 metros there. Um, San Jose fared a little bit better, um, right in the middle at 13th. Uh, and as many of you in the audience probably already know or could reasonably suspect, much of this has to do with lags in you know, leisure and hospitality sectors, so restaurants, bars, hotels. Um, when we just look exclusively as what, uh, what we're calling knowledge industries, knowledge jobs, so that's um, in uh, financial activities, professional business services, information, so you have your tech, your R&D, your finance, legal. Uh, we actually grew employment in, in the San Francisco metro by 4%. Um, next slide. All right, population. Uh, this is one of the ways in which we suffered the most as a region during the pandemic. Uh, a lot of people left, right? So the San Francisco and San Jose metros ranked second to last and last in this category, collectively lost almost 150,000 people, um, joining only LA, San Diego, and Miami as metros to have lost, large regions to have lost population from 2019 to 2021. Um, and these losses are, you know, a product of things you would expect, remote work, uh, the region's high cost of living pushed a lot of people out, especially white collar, uh, higher earn earning workers to settle elsewhere. Um, but I'll, I'll explain more on population in a bit that we have an, another slide that digs a little bit deeper. Next slide. All right, so investment. We, we tracked a number of metrics related to investment um, with a particular focus on office and commercial real estate activities. So you can see here net absorption, um, which we calculated here as a share of total office uh, stock, rentable office stock, the second to last in, in the San Francisco metro, meaning that during, during the pandemic, there was more space coming onto the market via you know, new construction, subleasing, lease expirations than there was new leasing activity. San Jose actually experienced sort of the opposite of that. Um, so there's more leasing activity than new space coming onto the market. Um, and I'll also get into that in, a, in some following slides on why you know, Silicon Valley, the peninsula fared a bit better as far as their office market goes. Next slide. So this is the one positive side, Jeff and I always, when we give these presentations, we're like, there's one good thing. We're, we're still at the top of VC funding. So um, as far as dollars we're bringing into the region, I mean, this is dollars, uh, annual funding uh, per capita. Uh, we're still by far number one and number two. I mean, well beyond Boston, which is the next highest metro. Uh, next slide. So this is that sales tax revenue piece I was talking about, one of the metrics that we developed, just kind of a glimpse into the money that different cities, we use cities as proxies for regions here because getting full regions was pretty difficult. Um, but we found that the city of San Francisco uh, collected almost $100, uh, $100 million, fewer dollars or 29 
percent fewer dollars in sales tax revenue from 2019 to 2021. So it took the hardest hit of any of the big West Coast cities that we were tracking. Uh, San Jose fared a bit better, you know, likely related to higher office occupancy, office attendance, um, that and that, that just kept other parts of the, their economy afloat. Next slide. So affordability. Um, finally, this was a uh, one of the metrics we looked at in this section was the ratio of, of median home prices to median household incomes and how that changed uh, during the pandemic. This was actually the only metric where Austin ranked last. So, you know, not, they're not, not, not so perfect, but home prices skyrocketed everywhere during the pandemic um, uh, due to you know, low mortgage rates, remote work, home buyer demand that a lot of cities um, like existing housing stock in cities just couldn't, couldn't keep up with the demand. Um, but in Austin, this was the surge was much more dramatic than other places. So a lot of people moved there in pursuit of affordability, first time home buyers leaving places like San Francisco, New York, um, uh, much more expensive markets. So local wages really couldn't keep up with that kind of, of new money coming in. So the home prices just skyrocketed at a much faster rate than, than wages. All right, next slide. Okay, so next section is our Bay Area deep dive. So we had our index and this, this section of the report, we wanted to dig deeper into, you know, what's driving or given the slides I just showed, what's, what's really not driving the region's recovery. Uh, so next slide. First up is population. Like I said, I, I wanted to dig a little bit deeper into what's really fueling our population loss. So from 2020 to 2021, we, the region saw a record negative net domestic migration. So almost 130,000 people left the region. You can see that gold bar right there. So really, really negative. Um, there was almost no foreign immigration. So those are the dark blue bars. Uh, so no international folks coming in and you know, death rates were higher, birth rates were lower. Um, the first look at 2022, so it's that next, next over, um, was released last month. Um, and showed a significant uptick. You can see the blue bar is back, the dark blue bar is back in uh, foreign immigration. Um, and death rates declined, birth rates increased, but you know, domestic out-migration remains a really key issue, key problem. That gold bar is still very negative. So if it weren't for those two blue bars being positive last year, um, we would have lost a lot more people um, than, than we did. Next slide. So top destinations of, of, of we, we looked at the top destinations of where people said they moved who left the Bay Area in 2021. And at the end of the day, a lot of them still moving to other parts of Northern California, right? Or California more broadly. So, you know, top destinations here, LA, Sacramento, Santa Cruz. Um, so of course there is a, people moving to places like Texas and Florida, but a, a lot of people still moving, you know, pretty close by. Next slide. So what's going on with the rental markets? So rents are still very high here in, in San Francisco compared to other places. Um, but San Francisco remains one of the only sort of big cities where rents are still down and, and actually lower than they were pre-pandemic. So given that population decrease that I was just that I just showed, um, you know, that, that decreased demand drove down rents um, and they've largely stayed there. Um, so there's been some new movement back in, back into the region, back into the city, and we might start seeing some increased demand later this year. Um, but so far growth has been pretty incremental. Next slide. So moving on to some, uh, yeah, regional real estate data, maybe unsurprisingly, San Francisco had the highest office vacancy rate, um, by the end of 2022, um, in terms of the region. Um, it also saw the biggest jump from pre-pandemic. Uh, so the fourth quarter of 2019 to the fourth quarter of 2022. So the office market was really hot before, not so hot now. Um, what's really interesting here is sort of the difference between Silicon Valley and the peninsula um, and how much better it fared in terms of its resilience during the pandemic with, it, with its office market. Um, so we saw that with net absorption, like I showed before. We saw that with um, overall sales volumes, which is another indicator in our index. Um, and of course, we're seeing it here with, with vacancy rates. And a you know, big hypothesis there is the difference in maturity of these two markets. So Silicon Valley and the peninsula, a lot older, home to a lot of deeply rooted tech companies that have been there for a long time, invested a lot of money in corporate campuses, et cetera. SF, by comparison, driven by a lot more you know, VC-backed startups, you know, younger public companies that sort of pivoted very easily um, to remote work when the pandemic started. So... 
I want to make it very clear too, this is not indicative of office attendance. So these are vacancy rates. This is about leasing activity. Office attendance, still pretty low, even in the San Jose Metro, which I said, you know, includes most of Silicon Valley, still at 42% um, with key, key FOB data that we've been tracking. Next slide. So we at the Bay Area Council, um, to get a better sense of how employers are thinking about office space and return to work strategies, we survey every other month um, over 200 employers region-wide um, to inform transit agencies, policymakers on you know, what employers are thinking about return to work and return to transit. So in our January survey of this year, 38% of employers said, it, uh, said that they have already reduced or consolidated their office space. And another 31% say they plan to reduce or consolidate their office space in the region over the next few years. So, you know, this indicates, this has serious implications. It indicates, you know, a significant loss in property taxes. Um, you know, some figures have projected a $200 million year, year by year decrease in the city of San Francisco alone. Um, next slide. Another question we ask is about workplace attendance. So we asked, um, you know, what, what frequency do your employees come into the office? Employers said that 45% of their employees come in one to three days a week. Another quarter don't come in at all. All right, this is my last slide, next slide. So we also looked at uh, you know, how wages grew and how that compares to how inflation grew. Um, and so when you adjust for inflation, so this is real wage growth, we found that the San Francisco Metro had the greatest increase in real wages. So, you know, wages increased at a faster rate than, than inflation did. Um, and of course, a big part of this, like I talked about, has to do with the cost of housing still being down um, and really not having grown as dramatically as peer regions. All right, final slide, I think is just a thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to wrap up there. Um, <laughs> if you like charts and graphs as much as we do, please check out our project page. Again, we'll send it out after this um, event. But a couple of final notes. I just wanted to thank CBRE. I want to thank Colin and Sarah and Joe. You guys were all extremely helpful. And as we worked through countless meetings of trying to hammer down you know, this index, what makes sense, make sense of all of this abundant data, I um, just wanted to thank you for your generous support and help with this project. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention is that this project is iterative. So we're going to be updating the data quarterly. And then there's going to be a part two to this research where the first part, again, was to establish you know, where we are, what's happened during the pandemic in a backward-looking way. Part two is kind of a little bit more forward-looking. We're going to look at sort of policy levers um, on how to create more vibrant downtowns. Like, what do we, what, where do we go from here? So that's going to be a bit more forward-looking, probably released sometime next year. So stay tuned for that. Thank you. All right. And I said, I said positive, positive vibes only from the speakers. So <laughs> we ended on the positive slide. Hey, that was super positive of me to say, we'll see what happens next. <laughs> uh, we do have a couple minutes for questions, positive leaning questions only for Abby. Yeah, I don't know if it's sponsored, but uh, usually we track uh, unicorns and decacorns and, you know, these really large privately held companies and their performance and, you know, how, how our region compares to others uh, with those companies. Have, did we look at that? We did look at that in this project, but correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, I think we're still home to what, like 15 out of the 50 decacorns in, in, the, in the country or something. I'm, I, I'm trying to remember. We have stats on that, but that's not something we specifically looked in in this project. Okay, there you go. So about half of, and you said unicorns or decacorns? Yeah, yeah, of the unicorns, there's about 50% are, are located here in the Bay Area. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Other positive questions? Yeah. Yeah. So if I triangulate the data, you looked at real wages, which showed us positive, but you didn't put uh, house prices and rental prices in real terms. And so if I combine the two, it would suggest that our purchase power parity has increased dramatically in the Bay Area versus other. MSAs. Yeah, so that's the, the, the real wage growth at the end does show a significant increase. So we, part, of, part of the issue here is it's average wage growth, right? So we have lost lower wage jobs here, which boosts that up with our rental prices down, home prices not up as much. We do look very good on the purchasing power uh, scale here. So there is a, there's more money to buy more expensive things here relative to other places. All right.
Let's thank Abby again. And again, this will be this is online at BayAreaEconomy.com. And if you have any questions on data methodology, want to get into the nitty gritty, which I'm always happy to do, you can find me after. I'm happy to happy to chat. All right, still okay. I, I think the the last panel it has it has to be positive, right? We gotta we gotta end on something good. All right, so let me welcome with the two panelists. I'm gonna punt on being a moderator unless you introduce yourself, but come on up, and I'm I'm gonna rearrange some furniture here, literal deck chairs. All right, so we have two fantastic panelists. We're gonna talk tech, we're gonna talk San Francisco, we're gonna talk economy, but first I just want you to introduce yourselves in the order you sat down. So Colin, you're gonna go first. Introduction and then give us a reaction to what you've seen so far. I'm uh, Colin Yasukochi with CBRE. I'm the executive director of our Tech Insight Center, which is a research group that specializes on analyzing the tech industry and how that relates to commercial real estate. Um, my reaction to what we've heard so far, the worst is behind us. Hi, I'm Kat Daniel. I am the Director of Economic Recovery Initiatives for the San Francisco Office of Economic and Workforce Development. Um, my reaction to what we've seen to, so far is um, yeah, not a lot of of new information. I mean, I think it. I think it confirms what we have all seen and experienced on the ground. Um, and I'm looking forward to a discussion about what we're going to do going forward. Yes. So this is the this is the going forward. This is the actual outlook of the outlook conference here. Everything we've had very uh, very few forward looking statements, but I hope we can kind of give the audience a bit of what uh, they can expect next. Uh, so I have this list of questions, but I want to make sure we get audience questions. So be thinking of questions. We're gonna spend lots of time with the audience, the pressure's on you, uh, but I'm gonna start with Colin. Um, you saw the divergence in real estate in San Francisco and San Jose. Can you talk a little bit about from the CBRE perspective, what's driving that difference in recovery that's pushed San Jose up? Yeah, I would say from a more macro level, I think Abby explained it pretty well, that it's the composition of the companies within the tech industry that really drove the changes in the commercial real estate market in San Francisco versus Silicon Valley. And that being that San Francisco has a much younger base of tech companies that are either venture backed or newly public and um, not quite as well established. But the, but the other thing that I think had a really big impact initially was when we did have the shutdown for the pandemic, tech companies in San Francisco were much more impacted because they were in businesses that were shut down like transportation, hospitality, retail. That led them to initially reduce their workforce and to also reduce the amount of, of real estate that they had. And many of the companies in San Francisco also have business models that are in fact supporting remote work, um, e-commerce, all these kinds of things. So they pivoted to basically do the same thing of what their products and services are intending to do. So many of them went remote first or you know, very hybrid where they didn't need as much office space in that was reduced um, compared to Silicon Valley, which many of the big tech companies actually benefited pretty dramatically from the pandemic because more people went online, bought stuff, used social media, used productivity tools, and they hired a tremendous amount of people that didn't necessarily translate into a lot more office space or commercial space that they needed. But at the very least, it kept that market far more stable. And I think that that's sort of the fundamental difference. And then the one other thing that I would put in there too is that San Francisco commercial real estate is largely a downtown market. That was very impacted by reliance on mass transit mm -hmm. and increases in, in other aspects that happened downtown as it related to businesses closing. There weren't enough workers here. Um, we saw you know increased crime and all kinds of other things that um, you know really impacted people's desire to want to come downtown. And a lot of those same issues are not really present, at least at the work sites in uh, Silicon Valley in general. And that's a good segue to Kat then to talk downtown. So the, the mayor's state of the city was very focused on downtown recovery. Can you give us kind of the cliff notes version of, of what's planned and thought about in terms of downtown? I will try. So that, I mean, even the cliff notes, 
The mayor at the State of the City announced the roadmap to downtown's future. Um, that is a nine strategy, 50 initiative plan. Um, that is the start. And I am not going to talk through all of that with you all today. I would love for you all to look at it. Uh, it is, you know, it is on OED's website. We made it a website specifically because we are not yet ready to put forward a plan. Things are changing and very dynamic and we are at the beginning of the future. Um, and so we wanted to put something forward that showed how the city was thinking about the situation, what the profound change in our downtown it sort of is, is created by, how we have responded to date, and what we're thinking about in the future. A couple of things that I think are really, um, uh, they're, they're happening now that I think that probably this group would be interested in. Uh, I would summarize in three buckets. If we are to get a handle on our downtown recovery and, and making it vibrant again, we have to address the cleanliness and safetyness issues and the perception of cleanliness and safetyness in San Francisco. The mayor over the last two years has done a tremendous amount of investment and focus on this issue specifically. And a lot of what the roadmap talks about is coordinating those investments. I think at this point we have about six new response teams that are managing different elements of street conditions. And what we are focused on right now is coordinating those so that they are efficient and effective uh, in, their, um, in their mission. Uh, there is right now a supplemental that has been put in, for, in front of the Board of Supervisors for $27 million to ensure that we continue the sort of increased public safety response and presence in our downtown. Um, but that is and has been the mayor's first priority. What's new is, um, is two things. I think the best, fastest, and easiest way to fill our office vacancies is to bring in more offices. And so we are trying very hard to look at what are the strategic industries that we now have an opportunity to attract to San Francisco that we did not two years ago because our vacancy rate was so low. And so as part of the roadmap, we are looking um, and again, have put forward legislation to signal very clearly that San Francisco is interested in retaining our existing businesses and attracting new ones. And so there are two tax measures in front, again, in front of the board right now. One is to pause tax increases that were scheduled for the next couple of years. And the other is to create a new tax incentive for, for new offices coming to San Francisco. And both of those we are hoping to sort of stabilize uh, and, and halt the losses and then to, to start bringing in and attracting new businesses into San Francisco. In a, and to close, in addition to sort of bringing in the, um, the offices, we also recognize that there has been a really profound shift in how offices work and how people are gonna be reporting to offices, why they're gonna be reporting to offices and that what we want to do in order to support the recovery and the, the robustness and vibrance of our offices in our downtown is really to supplement uh, a lot of the office uses with new uses, whether it be um, new industries, arts and culture, and some of those anchors and draws that will bring people in um, or residential and really looking at how our downtown can evolve. Great. Thanks, Kat. Um, let's stick on, on downtown and the importance of tech to downtown San Francisco in particular. So we've seen all these headlines, layoffs, hiring freezes. Colin, give us some context on that. How should we be thinking about that? And then how important is tech really to the San Francisco office economy? Right. So I would say that tech is the absolutely most important industry to the office market and to downtown San Francisco, because in my opinion, it's the only industry that can start an office recovery. All the other industries that are presently here or could come into the city are not really large enough to move the needle. You saw the chart, 4% vacancy to 28% vacancy. That's over 20 million, 25 million square feet. And so it's gonna take a massive growth effort to really 
fill those buildings and also to potentially convert some of it. But um, I think part of, the, part of the good news is that the tech industry is still pretty much intact in terms of its size. The employment levels today are still higher than they were pre-pandemic. And that's not only in the city, but the Bay Area as a whole. Um, that's even when you're accounting for layoffs. And so the, the thing with, with layoffs is, you know, we do, we always hear the headline numbers and what that really means to the Bay Area is something completely different. So we've heard, you know, job cuts of 10,000, 12,000, 5,000, or whatever those particular numbers are. But the tech industry has is, is become so global in really the last five to 10 years that those numbers are company-wide and global, and it affects all the locations across um, the globe that these, these companies have employees in. So I'll just give you a couple of examples because it's, it's out there publicly. So if you combine Google and Meta, they announced about 22,000 layoffs. And when you look at the uh, information that they submitted in their warn notices to the state of California, 4,200 of those were in the Bay Area, not insignificant, but certainly not 22,000. And if you went down company by company, you're going to see that um, of the big major companies, it's probably in that 10 to 20% range of whatever the headline number is, those numbers get impacted in the Bay Area. So it's no small number and any job cuts are not necessarily great. Um, but the big impact that's really had is on how companies are perceiving their office space and their willingness to make financial commitments to either renew their leases or relocate somewhere else. And so we've seen the leasing activity go down. And many companies have also reduced the amount of space that they have to accommodate their future, you know, remote hybrid type of working arrangements. So that's something that's, um, you know, needs to be, I would say, changed in the sense of having the employees want to come back to the office as opposed to being necessarily mandated by their employers. Got it. Got it. So there, there's a lot of empty space that we've seen. And Kat, one... One thing that everybody talks about is just turn it into housing, right? So can you give us the city's thoughts on that? How feasible is that? What, what is being discussed policy-wise? Because it is, you know, it's always, oh, just turn it into housing. It's great. But is it that easy? A converting an office tower into housing is not extremely easy. But um, I do want to underscore that housing is a fundamental aspect of our recovery. If we, if every business is going to contract its space, or let's say half of our businesses are going to contract their space needs by a third to two thirds, and we are going to bring in more businesses to fill that delta, we need houses for those people to work, uh, the, you know, for the, for the employers to bring their workforce, for them to have a talent pool to draw from, and so housing is absolutely critical. It is not, in the city's opinion, a problem or an issue for downtown to solve exclusively. And so we need, we need to produce housing at scale and we have a housing element and a executive director to begin implementing that housing, housing element in order to really deliver the number of units that need to be delivered. And that's on the order of 80,000. What, but we do want to look, uncover uh, or overturn every rock, whatever the saying is, um, right? And so I think that there is uh, going to be office space that as is now obsolete. I don't think it's going to be um, massive quantities, but I do think that there are going to be some office buildings, and um, and we are very excitedly waiting um, for an assessment by Gensler in partnership with Spur to really assess the feasibility of conversions of um, what types of office space into residential, what pencils, what makes sense, and then understand from the city's perspective and from a policy perspective, how can we get out of the way of having that happen? How can we remove procedural impediments uh, I think that we're going to get some financial recommendations about how to support it with subsidies and tax incentives, et cetera. And so we are, we are looking forward to getting that information. Great. Thanks, Kat. 
All right, Colin, last question for me, the most important question. Where does the office market go from here? This is your chance to be positive. Please do it. Okay. Well, I think, you know, when we look at the office market, there is a lot of supply that needs to be worked off. So there's a, there's a big job ahead of us to do that. And every little thing is going to, going to count and matter. Even though conversion to housing isn't going to be a huge aspect of it, it's going to contribute to taking some of that space off the market and to helping out the housing situation. So we would welcome any kind of support that we can get from the government. And there, there's been a good amount of conversions in the past. And, and if I'm remembering correctly, over the last, I would say, 10 or 15 years from the dot-com and the financial crisis, there's probably a couple of thousand units that were converted from office use to housing. So that's a lot of, that's, that's a good amount of units. Um, but I think what we really need to, to, to think about going forward is how do we encourage more people to come back town to fill the office space that they have already leased and more space that they will need? Because that is really the single biggest issue that we have here in the city. And, you know, we're looking at, I think, you know, the castle numbers, which are the ones that we look at maybe in the high 40s in terms of the return to office in San Francisco. And that's widely divergent by day of the week. So Friday is probably your lowest day where you're going to see, you know, office attendance in the, you know, mid 20s. And then maybe on a, a Tuesday or Wednesday or a Thursday, depending on your company, you're probably looking at numbers in the, you know, mid 50s. Uh, type of a situation. But um, I think what most companies have come to the conclusion is that if I'm only asking people to come in half the day, I cannot have half the space because what I need to plan for is that one day when most of the people come in and that's the amount of space that I need because the last thing they want is for their people to show up and to have not enough space for them to do what they need to do while they're there. And my own personal opinion is I think there is a possibility that many companies have overcorrected on the downside and reduced their office space too much. And as more and more people come back to the office, they're hopefully going to realize they need more office space. And that will be one source of demand. In addition to, you know, as the economy starts to improve, uh, uncertainty eases, hopefully that'll be by the end of this year, we'll start to see new hiring and, and new demand for office space, but there, again, there's, there's a lot that uh, is ahead of us and it will take some time. But I will say that, you know, the good news is that the, as I think Jim had said early on that the Bay Area and the tech industry always surprises us on the strength of its recovery and it'll come sooner than we think. All right, that was, that was positive, that was good, right? Okay, we'll, we'll take that. All right, Kat, a final question for you. We're all here. It's Tuesday. We made the commutes. You know, what should we be telling our friends and coworkers and our other colleagues that are, are not coming into San Francisco? What, what message would you deliver to those businesses and workers that are not coming? I mean, I, th I think the message would be it's not what you think it is. So we've, we've seen a lot in the news around the story of San Francisco and the zombie apocalypse that is downtown and the devastation, you know, and I think that people who have not been here and come inevitably say, it's not that bad. And, and it is, and that is not to discount our challenges. We have real challenges and we are working hard to address those, but those challenges have eclipsed everything that San Francisco is. Um, and, uh, and I think that we, are, we also need to work hard. And I would love to challenge this group who is a room full of leaders uh, to, to challenge that narrative actively. Every time somebody tells you or you're giving a speech or you're having an interview that um, you don't, don't not talk about San Francisco's challenges, that's fair, but remember that that is not all that we are and that that is not what we want to be projecting into the world. Um, I think I'm going to close with yeah, that. That's good. That's a good last statement. All right, let's go to the audience questions. Start here. I'm going to run this around. Great presentations this morning. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm going to try to tee up a question that I hope 
will draw some more optimistic answers. It's part of what I was hoping to hear, particularly since CBRE was such a big sponsor of all this research, which is supply and demand should make the cost per square foot of office space in San Francisco dramatically go down, which should make it easier to attract companies to come to San Francisco. What's the outlook of the drop in the price per square foot going forward? When should we expect it? How deep will it go? You know, that's been a very interesting dynamic that's happened not only in San Francisco, but really across the country that supply and demand as it relates to price have not reacted in the way you would expect. If our vacancy went from 4% to 28%, rent should have gone down pretty dramatically, but we're 10 to 15% lower than where we were during the peak. The financial crisis resulted in a 30% drop in rents, the dot-com, a 70% drop in rents. And so this situation is we have very low demand and price is not really a driver of that demand. And early on, when we saw vacancy go from like, say, maybe 4% to 15 or 20%, the vast majority of that burden was on the tenants because they were trying to sublease that space. So they continued to pay their landlords. So their landlords were still looking at vacancy under 10%, which is completely tolerable to them. That's shifted quite dramatically. So I think we might see some rent weakness this year, but it's going to be nothing like the kinds of declines we've seen in the past. Um, so it's one of those things that don't wait for it to come because it's unlikely to come in, in the way that it should, given the fact that uh, supply is dramatically high and demand is low. So it's, it's, it's very inefficient from a market perspective. Other questions for Colin and Kat? Thank you. Uh, this might be a question more for Kat. Um, you know, the, the implications for the Bay Area's economic performance for the state and to a lesser extent, the federal government are profound. Yet, from the perspective of an entity that is competes for grants, I see a lot of emphasis at the state level and let's give our money to the Central Valley. And, and the folks in the Bay Area, they're better off, but the Central Valley really needs to help. I'm just curious to what extent you feel that the state and the federal government are aware of the challenges here and are helpful. I mean, I think that that is also a pretty dynamic situation. Um, I think that at the outset, there was a feeling that San Francisco was going to be fine because, and, and I think San Francisco is going to be fine um, for optimism, but, uh, but I think that there was an assumption that San Francisco has deep pockets. Uh, it has tech that is doing very well in terms of jobs. And I mean, just the strength of the industry is still really, really strong. What is different, and nobody, I think, at the outset could really like wrap their heads around it, is that the, all of those workers are not circulating in our downtown. And so while the industry remains strong, the geography is really, really impacted. And, and that's brand new. And that is something that was created by the pandemic and the, and the hybrid work schedules. And it wasn't something that um, it got, got a lot of, it's not that it didn't, it was getting plenty of attention, but I don't think people realized how profound and lasting that would be. And I think that people, now the state and the federal government are seeing all sort of central business districts struggle with this and they are seeing San Francisco struggle with it most. And so I do think, and I am hopeful that that will translate into a much greater emphasis uh, and support uh, in the way that we saw New York state really rally around New York city and would love something similar to happen in California. So staying on that topic of, of New York versus San Francisco, because it's really easy. Um, I think Abby showed us in the data that the per capita venture capital investment in, in California and San Francisco is much higher than anywhere else. I think that's a little misleading just based on the size of the rounds that we have out here compared to other places. And what Colin told us is really the composition of the city is younger, smaller companies. 
New York State just announced an incentive to match up to $250,000 in seed funding uh, for younger companies to move to New York. Is that something that we can match as a city or as a region to be competitive? I mean, I think that it's a really interesting idea. And I'm going to bring that back to, uh, to the office. I think that what we see, and Colin, I, you know, feel free to weigh in, but um, is that that's actually a strength of ours, right? We do continue to have so much innovation, so much venture capital and investment. And, um, and we really are spinning off. And I think that as some recent data that I just, that I just saw, so that the layoffs that happened during the pandemic in the tech sector, like they have created new startups and we're seeing a lot of activity in business formation in the Bay Area. What we need to do is keep those businesses here as they scale. And I think that that is something that San Francisco has struggled with um, more than the, like the venture, the startup stage. And so that is where a lot of our sort of policy objectives are, are focused on right now. Right. Right. Yes. Because I would add on, on the later stage and a lot of times the bigger rounds of funding that, you know, pump up San Francisco's numbers. There's a good amount of that money that doesn't get spent here as a lot of companies are hiring outside of San Francisco with that money just because they're based here and that money is, is you know, tagged as being San Francisco money. It's not all staying here. And we, like as you just mentioned, have an incentive to try to get them to spend that money here by hiring more people, you know, patronizing businesses, taking more office space or whatever it might be. It's no more questions. <laughs> Thank you. So I have a question about all those housing units that were uh, promised or ambitiously looking forward to, I guess. I mean, was the unemployment rate at 1.8%? How are you, who's going to be building those, all those units? And then another question, or what are the assumptions that we are even going to need as many units looking at our demographics and uh, out migration trends. So there was somebody from the carpenters here. Is he still here? Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that I, my understanding is that we do still have a labor force for like construction workers. They are, they are on the bench and they are ready to go. Um, and so I, I'm not too worried about the labor force for construction. I am more worried about some of the things that were mentioned uh, by the economists around uh, about interest rates and the cost of development and how that is going to be able to deliver the housing. And I think that this, you know, the, the housing element attempts to put new tools into the mix like um, the in infrastructure financing district and impact fee reform that brings down those costs. Um, I mean, we are a regional economy and, and we do have like region, the region to draw from. Uh, so I'm less concerned about the labor force. The second part of your question, oh, the demand for housing. Yeah, I, so what we saw, and I think maybe Abby and Jeff can weigh in uh, if, if I am misspeaking, but although we did experience a great deal of out migration, much of that out migration was to the surrounds. And we still have a extremely strong economy in terms of job, a 1.9% unemployment rate. There are businesses that cannot find workers. We just saw that there was a tremendous amount of, of real wage growth. All of these things are the reasons that people come to places looking for opportunity and so I do think that if we can maintain the strength of our economy, that there will be demand for jobs uh, and for people to, to come here, for people to stay here and take the housing so that they can participate in this economy. Is it going to be a positive final question? Or is it, is it, is it negative? Well, let's make it a positive answer, though. Final question. But this is for Kat, and I think... <clears throat> Kat, maybe you can spin it in a very positive way. 
So um, what are the conversations between the mayor's office and the board of supervisors around the recovery plan and in particular around uh, the taxation reforms and the taxation incentives? Um, we've been hearing things on the news about maybe some of the supervisors feel like it's too pro-business, but we also recognize that that's what you need to do, right, to bring um, businesses back. So what are the conversations and how do we get full support? So I think that, I mean, my response to that um, narrative, I guess, would be that the first tax incentive around not increasing taxes for existing businesses, that applies to our industries that were hardest hit by the pandemic and have a disproportionate amount of small businesses in them. That is retail, restaurants, hospitality, manufacturing. These are industries that everybody in San Francisco, I think we could agree, really wants to stay in San Francisco and are struggling to do so because of the financial implications of the, of the you know, the shutdowns and, and everything that the, was brought in through the pandemic. The second uh, incentive, which I think is probably the more controversial one at the board, is this new incentive to give a um, to give a gross receipts tax discount to offices locating here and moving in. I think that there are two there are two things that I would say to that. Um, one, again, San Francisco has been and we hope will continue to be the economic engine and jobs engine of the entire region. And the way that we do that is by maintaining a strong business community and, and the presence of business and jobs in San Francisco. Our downtown is uniquely positioned to do that in a very competitive way, but we need to signal to businesses who again have heard this narrative that San Francisco is dead, that San Francisco is not business friendly, that San Francisco does not care about tech or about business or about, you know, does not want businesses coming in. We do want jobs coming in. And we need to signal, as we need to signal, make that signal clear. Um, I do also think that we have an opportunity right now with a, you know, upwards of 25% vacancy rate in our office sector that we did not have prior to the pandemic. Businesses were locked out. They, we did not have vacancy so that businesses who, who wanted to come into San Francisco could come into San Francisco. And we now have an opportunity to invite new businesses into San Francisco, including businesses in industries other than tech, and to really diversify the industry mix and the business mix that we have in San Francisco. And for many of those new businesses, they don't even think of us as a market anymore because they were not able to access San Francisco. And now with this incentive, I think we hope that we could get businesses like Delta Dental or I, I mean, who knows, but businesses that moved out to come back into San Francisco and for others to, to really look at us in a, in a compelling way. Um, and that, <clears throat> and I think that that is a boon to everybody. I'll, I'll add one thing is I think that the city has an incredible incentive to want more workers to come back to downtown because it affects the taxes pretty dramatically. Commercial mm -hmm. rent tax, the gross receipts tax, um, all the sales taxes because downtown is the biggest contributor to decline in sales tax. So the city has a huge incentive to, to want that to happen. But I think we're kind of all aligned from a business community and the city to, to have that happen. It's just a matter of what gets put in place to to accelerate that. So I'm, I'm encouraged by that. At least our, our goals and objectives are, are aligned. We want more people back town, downtown because that's gonna solve a lot of problems. I think we could do one more question in the front. Is it a quick question? Quick. Lots of caveats in the question. Awesome. Not sure it's even a question. So you, you might agree that people who work in offices are human beings and uh, Boy, I have lived in Boston, I've lived in Austin, I've lived here, I've lived down on the peninsula. I can tell you if you're a human being, the weather here and what's available to you within a couple of hours of here is incomparably better, 
than those other places. So I hope you're pitching that. I'm, I'm pitching everything I can. <laughs> That's a good final word. With that, let's thank Colin and Kat for the great insight. All right, and with that, um, let me again thank CBRE for their incredible partnership on this uh, event and on the report. Uh, please check out bayareaeconomy.org for even more charts and graphs. Uh, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to Sylvan at the Fed. And uh, thank you all for coming. Your t-shirts are in the mail. Have a good day.